All right, while people are filing into the virtual room, um, I'll just give some administrative notes. So welcome to this I2S2 uh, Informatics and Implementation Science Learning Series session. Um, we will begin in about, I'd say about a minute or so. Um, this event is being recorded. So if your video is on, please make sure that it is off. I guess that's not really possible if you're in the right room, but I think it's important to just state that. Um, as you have questions during the presentation, you can go ahead and put them into the chat and I will uh, um, read them at the end after uh, the presentation and we can, during the Q&A session. Uh, and so again, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Sarkar, I'm from the Renown Quality Institute. Uh, this series uh, is sponsored uh, uh, by Advanced CTR. Uh, the Brown Center for Biomedical Informatics and the Implementation Science Corps at the um, um, Brown Department of uh, uh, Psychiatry and Human Behavior. Uh, today, I am uh, uh, delighted to welcome Dr. Jonathan Teich, uh, a, a colleague and friend from uh, too many years to recall, because it only makes me feel and probably make Jonathan also feel uh, a little old in the years. Um, but uh, um, he now serves as the Chief Medical Information Officer for InterSystems. Uh, for my students who are out in the audience, InterSystems uh, uh, currently manages cache, which you know goes back to months. Um, and uh, uh, InterSystems uh, um, is uh, also uh, a major uh, entity, a uh, global entity uh, in areas, uh, in multiple areas, including healthcare. Uh, uh, Dr. Teich is also a practicing emergency physician at the, the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, uh, and is also on the faculty at Harvard. Uh, Dr. Teich is known for many things, uh, but perhaps most germane to our presentation today, uh, working with electronic health record data, uh, supporting computer provider order entry, knowledge retrieval, and clinical decision support. He also serves as the clinical architect and designer of OpenMRS uh, on the global scale, looking at how OpenMRS as a uh, open source electronic health record system uh, can be used and deployed in um, lower middle income countries. Um, so with that, uh, I could go on for hours and hours uh, talking about all of the great things that uh, Dr. Teich uh, 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 knows and does, uh, but I'm just going to hand it right over to him. Uh, you're on mute. It's important to have one of those at least once during every... every... <laughs> so I actually had a, a experience this morning where I was doing a conference on my iPad and uh, even though my iPad indicated that my camera was off, the people on the other end said, oh no, we can see you. So, uh, so now I'm a little bit snake bit. So I'll be, I'll probably be putting duct tape on all my cameras for the next, next several months. Um, so good morning and uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's actually noon time in the East. So good, good afternoon to all. And uh, so today, as, uh, as Neil said in his lovely introduction, uh, I've spent a good deal of time thinking about, working about, implementing, designing clinical decision support, and uh, all the different things that it can do, uh, and trying to make sure that it actually does them, because there's a lot of clinical decision support out there, and we kind of all grew up with CDS as the thing that computers should be doing, telling us to do the right thing, giving us the right information, making us all expert physicians. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to do it wrong, and uh, so in order to realize all of its benefits, one has to not only appreciate what it can do and where it can do, but also be able to talk about the ways that you can design it properly. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk over the last third of the talk about different uh, new trends in CDS, what it's being done for new data types, uh, where it's being used in new applications, some of its applications to COVID-19, uh, some of its applications to global health. So, uh, so um, just uh, particularly for the students. Jonathan, you might want to share your slides. I might want to, oh, okay. That's right. I turned off the sharing, so let's do that. Boy, I'm really not, uh, not hitting all the Zoom, the Zoom knowledge stuff today. Looks good. So, are, we, are we there now? Yep, perfect. Excellent, thank you. 
So uh, for particularly for the students in the audience uh, and, and for anybody else, this is sort of a, a graph of, of, of me. Uh, so uh, my life has been uh, scattered through lots of different things. I was uh, primarily in academic informatics for the, probably the first half of what I did. Um, and I've spent most of the last half in on the industrial side. Uh, one day I had an epiphany that that as an academic, I'm adding to knowledge, which is still very valuable, but I I'm more of a builder and I wanted to build things that could actually take that knowledge and use it. So, uh, so the yellow things are things I'm still involved in. So I'm still a practicing doc at, at the Brigham uh, in emergency medicine, still working with OpenMRS on all sorts of different information technologies for the low and middle income countries of the world. And uh, there's uh, certainly Brown has uh, through Hamish Fraser and other and Ian Basher and other people uh, have all kinds of great expertise in this. Um, and uh, spent some time, spent several years working with ONC. That's the little government eagle over there. So if you have, uh, if anybody has questions about different kinds of careers in informatics, uh, I can probably tell you how to balance one versus the other. So. Uh, feel free to ask me or write me later on. So I think this is what a lot of us think about in terms of, of clinical decision support, right? It is, uh, I'm looking at somebody's electronic medical record and I see Mr. Hope here and, and I'm looking at his summary, but suddenly something popped up on the screen here and it says, hey, uh, this person who has heart failure uh, is not really taking the right dose of his medication. So something's wrong with the care that's being given to him, something that can be optimized better. Um, so we're, try, we're saying, hey, this is a piece of information. We're telling you that patients like this probably should be switched in this following way. Um, and we're also giving you a little bit of source on what kind of that information uh, what in the literature is supporting that. We're also telling you why this particular alert fired so you can justify why this is coming so you don't think like this was crazy. Uh, and we can also send you to some other references. Uh, and uh, the one thing that it also can do, which this one's not doing, which was, which would be to immediately take you to the prescribing screen where I can change that dose in a moment. So those four steps tell you what's going on, tell you the supporting data, tell you the supporting information and literature, and making action possible. Those are kind of the four hallmarks of a effective piece of clinical decision support, whether it be an alert or something else. Uh, and we'll probably return to that several times during this conversation. So yeah, we find that we've all learned our stuff in medical school or nursing school or pharmacy school. Uh, and we find that we're doing the best we can. And most of the time we know the answers to what comes up, uh, but the statistics will tell us that most of the time we don't always do in the heat of the battle, the things that we've learned. So you know, we know that more than half of all patients, even in the best tested locations, are not getting proper preventive care management for their age and for their risk factors. Uh, when I started my career, there was a famous paper that said that 44,000 persons were dying every year from adverse events. Um, and later papers made that 190,000, later papers made that a 400,000, the point is there's a whole lot of people that are getting sick and dying from adverse events and that a lot of those are preventable. And to be preventable doesn't mean that I need the knowledge of the leading expert in the field. Uh, most adverse events are really based on things you've already learned, but just don't bring up to your primary access in your brain at the critical moment. It's something you learned once, and this patient is an unusual circumstance, so you just don't have that particular fact at the tip of your fingers. So in fact, the value of clinical decision support is to bring information to your top of mind, even if you've already learned it before. So in a book we wrote that, uh, about improving, out and, uh, improving outcomes with clinical decision support, we define it this way. We say that clinical decision support is not so much giving you an alert, it's providing information, providing clinicians or patients with knowledge and patient-related data or information, and giving you a nice filtered, presented view that says, hey, just like that box that came up with Mr. Hope, uh, it says, you know, here is just the information you need to make a decision on this particular circumstance. So filtered, presented at appropriate times for the benefit of patient care. 
And again, it's stuff you've learned and it's just reformatted, it's organized, it's filtered and it's delivered to be when and how you need them. So, you know, in, in the real world, probably the most common thing that looks like clinical decisions board is the, the automobile GPS. Uh, whether it be on your phone, whether it be a dedicated unit, you know, these things are amazing, right? On your phone or on your GPS, you have a map of every street in the country. You have access to these 57 orbiting satellites, which are telling you precise location information. And on top of all that, you're, you've got this incredible routing algorithm, which will take you from point A to point B with the most efficiency and the best speed and the best time or distance, whatever you're doing. All that stuff is happening under the scenes. But what you see is something that says, turn right at the next roundabout, right? Go five miles and then stop it at, at such and such. Uh, take exit nine, which says the following on the signs. Uh, incredible database. And what it's giving you is the filtered, tailored, something that's perfectly tailored to where you are right now, exactly where you are right now, and which is organized in a way that you can take action on it quickly and have maximum value on it. And oh, by the way, it can also tell you what the price of gasoline is at the nearest gas station and can tell you what the weather is going to be tomorrow and all the rest of that stuff. So, uh, so it's, it's interesting to think of this as kind of a great model of what a CDS system that's effective looks like. So there's lots of different kinds of CDS and most people think about alerts, right? Most people think about something that says, okay, you know, I'm doing this and I want you to know that there is something else going on. I'm in the middle of prescribing and it says, hey, wait a minute, this is a immediate alert. This says um, you are prescribing aspirin, but you already take putting this patient on another non-steroidal. So there's a therapeutic duplication. Or the patient is already on warfarin and there's a major drug-drug interaction you should know about. And an alert will come to you and say, okay, um, once again, here's what I'm worried about. Here's what the patient's information is that supports this. Here's some uh, reference information in that big paragraph that tells you why you shouldn't be doing this. And as I mentioned, here's a button you can press which will get this thing off of your screen, which is what you really want it to do, and which will uh, result in a beneficial action for your patient. So that's an alert, and most people think of, of, of CDS as alerts. And alerts are great, um, but you can't have too many of them because people get annoyed by these things disrupting the process of care that they were already involved in. Um, but alerts get used a lot. Um, this is, uh, this is a, a health information exchange in New York happens to be an InterSystems customer. Um, but uh, these are the alerts that HealthX has sent out to providers and to public health about new cases of COVID-19 or new high-risk patients for COVID-19. And you can see they send out tens and, and sometimes hundreds of thousands in the peak of the things last April, hundreds of thousands of alerts uh, per day. Uh, all of those are valuable. Now, hopefully one person isn't receiving all those 300,000 alerts, um, they get, have to be distributed to appropriate people. They have to be set up, or maybe they just get fed into a, uh, a an information system itself. But you know, you send out these things, and you can make sure that when something happens, there is someone who is aware of it and can take action on it. So that's how alerts work very well. Um, other things, order sets, very common form of clinical decision support. So an order set is a collection of somebody's idea of the best way to take care of something uh, represented as orders, usually for inpatient, but also for ambulatory care. So this is a hyperlipidemia ambulatory order set, which says, if I'm seeing a patient with this kind of thing, I probably want to make sure I order a CBC and a basic metabolic, and I want to do my lipid, lipid profile. The purpose of order sets is to make sure that I don't forget things, and to make sure that I have a good look at what somebody's ideas of the best care. So typically a pneumonia order set will give you a couple of pieces of information about what are the best antibiotics for this particular situation, whether it's community acquired or whether it's hospital acquired and allow me to quickly do the right action. And in some hospitals, order sets account for 60, 70% of all orders that are placed. Um, but this again is something which is less intrusive compared to alerts because I'm writing orders at this moment anyway. So I, this is a friend of mine. This is actually letting me process my current task faster, 
but it's also helping me do it more correctly. So that's why this is a very high value type of CDS. Other things, uh, relevant data summary. Sometimes all I want is to pull together data about this patient in, in a certain way that I can use. Um, this particular one is a very old. This is a, uh, this is a sign out uh, display, which shows you, which, which is designed so that the people on cross coverage for a patient could have a quick look at what's going on with that patient. So in one quick look, they could see the patient's general status, their problems, their last labs, and any to-dos that were placed by the regular doctor who had admitted them. Um, you know, we had did, done a study which showed that before this was in place, patients were six times more at risk of having adverse events happen when they're being cross-covered compared to when they're being, uh, when their admitting doctor is in present in the hospital. And when we added this bit of information technology, uh, that went down to even money. So this isn't an alert, this doesn't get in your way. I can pull this up when I want, but just having that information in the right form and with the right filtering makes a big difference in the adverse events profile of this patient. Uh, this is a tracking display. So this is a, what we call a relevant data summary in our, in our list of, of 10 different types of, of clinical decision support. Uh, so this is a display that's used in our emergency department, and it's basically there to solve the emergency doctor's most important information issue, which is multitasking. So I'm an emergency doc. I've got 14 patients in my care at the same time, and I have to figure out who needs my attention first. Uh, so this display, first of all, it's kind of nice. It's geographically oriented the same way that the patients are oriented, so it gives me a little bit of, of something to hold on to. It gives me a point of reference. But I can see that uh, the patients who are green, uh, these are patients who have dispositions. So I know that we've already, their admission is already taken care of. Uh, the patients who are in red or brown, uh, those people have pending orders that I need to take care of. Uh, the ones who have a yellow background, they've been here for longer than four hours. So they're past our uh, ideal threshold for getting the patient out of the emergency room. So uh, this gives me a chance to really uh, focus on them as well. So I can look at those and just by a quick look at these colors, I can get a sense at where my attention should be focused. And then these cards have information about who's the doctor, who's the nurse, um, some information that's encrypted there about what labs have been done. And I can right click on these and do all kinds of different things like look up their lab results. So this again is something which promotes my workflow and which keeps me from forgetting, you know, if I, if I forget about Mr. Stein over there, um, these aren't real names, um, if I forget about him, then this will be there to remind me by color or by some other way of grabbing my attention. Um, info buttons or trigger display. So uh, here we're talking about how do I get information about something? So I'm looking for reference information. So I want to look up, I've got a patient who's got angina. I want to know what the best therapy is for angina. So I could do that in my order set, but I'm not writing orders right now. So I want a reference, but references, you know, references are big um, and they require searching and they require lots of steps and people don't often go to valuable references if it's annoying to get there. Um, but an info button will say, okay, I'm just looking at your problem list in your EMR over here. And just by clicking on that little uh, notepad thing next to the angina in the problem list, will take me in my right panel, you know, embedded right inside my workflow to a reference on Angina. So in one click, instead of four clicks plus a search string, um, I'm getting directly to the information I want. And if you study this, you'll find that people will use references and go to references somewhere between 10 and 50 times more often uh, if they can find they can get to them more easily. So being able to encode the problem and building up this facility is a great way to bring information right to your fingertips. Um, other kinds of things, uh, real-time dashboards. So this is something which people will use on a longer term basis. So uh, this is a dashboard. This actually shows uh, at one particular point last summer, uh, this was COVID hotspots in New York. So this was, uh, the, the red basically shows areas where there has been a change in, uh, in COVID diagnosis. I think this wasn't actually COVID diagnosis. This was a change in number of people being uh, admitted to emergency departments for respiratory complaints. So we find that down in New York City and up in, I don't know where, what part that is, somewhere in, in Saratoga or someplace like that, um, there were 
sudden increases over the past several days in some kind of uh, surveillance measure, in this case, respiratory complaints. And the thing down at the bottom is uh, another way of tracking this. In this case, we're counting the number of people that have low lymphocyte counts presenting to hospitals. And we see that there's kind of a general control level. We expect them to be following a particular curve. Uh, so if it suddenly jumps off that curve, if it gets too high, uh, or if it gets something that generates this red, it's gonna attack my attention. So I can tell if I'm the New York Commissioner of Public Health that there's something going on down in the city and there's something going on in Saratoga. Uh, and I probably want to give them a phone call and see what's happening, or possibly I wanna deploy some community health resources up in those directions to tamp down whatever thing is going on. And as the pandemic recedes, which we hope and believe it will, um, and receives and goes to sort of a more low level endemic level, this is gonna become more important again, being able to focus on where little hotspots are happening so that I can direct my resources to tamp them down. So these are very important uh, display kinds, dashboard kinds of, dis of with, which can alert me to something going on in my community. Uh, just one or two other types, uh, predictive analytics. Uh, this is a, a list of patients. And what this is actually doing um, is, this is being able to take a look at uh, probability of readmission of patients. So this is a calculation that was done uh, on all patients on this unit. And it can use any number of different kinds of things. There's, there's Apache scores, there's Braden scores, there's severities. There's lots of different kinds of severity measures. And through the uh, through the benefit of machine learning. This is one of the things that machine learning is actually doing pretty well, which is looking at probability of readmission. So I can do whatever algorithm I want and I can bring up a display every day that says, okay, I've got 10 people on the unit. Um, which of those people is at risk of having to be readmitted if I don't do something different? So it said, well, the ones you want are probably the ones down at the bottom here, the three that have the 20% mark. Maybe I should direct my attention there and again, here's clinical decision support focusing my attention. So I can do that. I can then click on that, by the way, and I can drill down into why it actually came to that 20% figure. Um, it happens to do with this patient's lab results and vital signs. Uh, and I can go in and, and take appropriate action. So those are sort of eight or nine of the, the types of CDS. There's probably about 10 or 12 different categories. Uh, and they make a difference. Uh, they really actually help out. Uh, we know that CDS done well uh, does a great thing for predict preventing adverse events, does a great thing for improving quality, does a great thing for improving resource use. This is uh, one of many particular studies. This was a study of order entry with clinical decision support on uh, proper drug dosing. So up at the top, uh, this was before order entry was put into place. Uh, we did a study, this was our, our work actually, and found that uh, over 2% of all orders were considered to actually have been for overdoses in the opinion of expert pharmacy people. Uh, and as soon as order entry was put in with, uh, with sort of suggested doses, that immediately dropped down by a factor of four. And then through additional clinical decision support efforts, um, you could actually bring that down lower and lower. And now the number of overdose orders we have is quite small. Um, the other two talk about uh, the use of CDS to promote the use of a favored drug among a category of drugs, um, and one which was done to make sure that people were monitoring, uh, in this case, when, uh, when heparin was started, to make sure that, uh, that people were getting appropriate PTT measures and being able to track that. So you can see that, well done, it makes a big difference in people's actions, and it makes a big difference in uh, the kinds of uh, positive or negative events that can happen. Um, However, as I mentioned, it's very possible to have CDS kind of causing problems. And the news tends to kind of fluctuate. Um, sometimes every other month you see papers that say that CDS is doing great. And sometimes you see every other month, here's a place where a decision support system caused an error because it was, it was oversensitive or something like that. So it's very important to actually design CDS in ways that are going to be effective. So let's talk for a little bit about kind of how CDS should be organized, how it should be designed. And I think you'll probably see this in your minds as something which works very well for alerts, but you'll probably find that it's actually applicable to many, many different kinds of, of CDS. So 
figure from our book. Uh, so typically, CDS starts with a triggering event. So a new lab test occurs. And the first thing I have to do is figure out whether I even need to do anything on it. So is this lab test one of the lab tests that I'm following? Uh, you know, it's, maybe if it's a potassium, I'm going to do some further logic on it. Maybe if it's a uh, something that I care a little bit less about for acute conditions, then I might, I might not worry about it quite so much. But then rules can be run out of your rule store. And the rules most of the time, hopefully, will say, OK, you're good. Keep on going. And I leave that, and nobody's the wiser. Uh, or the rule may say, hey, I need some kind of notification, some kind of intervention. So it will go over to the right side of this tree, and it will say, OK, I need to notify you. Uh, now, if I'm doing this in real time, and this is responding to an order I'm doing right at the moment, I don't have to notify you because you're right in front of the screen anyway. But if it's a lab test, and I'm not in front of the computer at that time, then it needs to page me, it needs to put something in my inbox, whatever it is. So it has to notify and I have to acknowledge that it has been, uh, that I've seen the notification. And then it says, okay, let me give you one of those presentations I just showed you and let you take action items. So again, appropriate trigger, appropriate logic, justification on the presentation and action items. Um, and those are the four uh, kind of watchwords. These things should be precise. You should state your reasons, show the data, and make it easy to either comply with the requirement with the request or to take an exception. Um, you know, in sort of more modern times, uh, you know, this happens to take the form of several different components connected by, often connected by APIs. So now we're seeing in kind of more modern technology that the rule logic might be something which sets off somewhere else. I might have a source that's offline, a source that's that's available as a service, which actually has its own rule library, which does rule logic. So maybe there's one particular place I like to go to that has cardiology prevention rules. Uh, and then on my own system, I will be capturing trigger events like new lab filings, like, like new admissions. And that can go to a trigger manager, which is, might be on a different piece of hardware that I've got, which is managing and dispatching all the triggers so that Maybe I split them up a couple, among a couple of different types of a uh, couple of different different processors, and then I can go call out to my rule library, and then I have another API which decides whether the notification will happen through my paging system or through uh, Direct, which is a secure kind of messaging system, uh, something else like that. So it's more componentized, but it's still really the same uh, the same structure happening. Uh, we find that these components are very often repeatable. So there's only a certain number of places where I really often want to trigger CDS, new registration, new admission or discharge, uh, new observation recorded, the start of an order, uh, the end of an order for medication, new test result. Um, there's only a few types of presentations and there's only a few types of actions. So it's not like I have to think about putting one of these trigger uh, uh, initiators everywhere in my software. I can probably put them about 12 different places and have 95% of the clinical decision support that I want. So it's a tractable problem. Um, the type of CDS that I want to do often has to do with the kind of workflow I'm at. So this is sort of a schematic representation of what it's like to go through an encounter from pre-encounter to assessment and documentation and orders and results and discharge all the way back to my home care again. And if you think about the different things we had in our list of CDS types, they all tend to have their homes in different parts of the workflow. Obviously, order sets when I'm ordering, um, error checking when I'm doing order handling, um, alerts based on results, uh, patient education guides that I can give out when I'm discharging patients, and then sort of more of the monitoring for patients that are at home or patient reminders, maybe text kind of processing that I can do uh, every couple of days when the patient is at home. So the type of decision support I want depends on the situation, depends on the particular clinical scenario I'm dealing with, and depends on where I am in workflow. And sometimes you can combine these. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having a couple of different decision support things targeted at the same uh, particular target for uh, you know, making sure that most of my patients are getting vaccines or making sure that my patients are getting appropriate medications for their hypertension. Um, there's all kinds of hot topic areas that are very amenable 
um, and I won't go into this in, in depth, but you know, sepsis has been a big feature. You probably have, if you're practicing physicians or nurses, you probably see a little sepsis warning come up on your screen quite often. Gee, this patient has a number of lab tests and vital signs which suggest that maybe they have sepsis and sepsis is so important that we want to bring it to your attention so that you can take action on it and we'll take you to an order set if you like. Um, ERAS, which is uh, early recovery after surgery, uh, is something which uses CDS logic to make sure that people are closely followed up and you're really taking care of those post-surgical patients who have the biggest needs. Um, global disasters, uh, when uh, in Ebola, CDS turned out to be very useful for uh, being able to detect patients at risk, being able to quickly uh, bring them into the appropriate levels of care and so on. But global, it's really being used even more for uh, long-term things like maternal health, immunization, and so on. We'll talk about that in a second. So let's spend the rest of the time talking about some of the new flavors of CDS and what we can do about this. Um, so um, a lot of CDS that you think about is reactive. Uh, I mentioned, you know, it's, it's an alert, it's the most common thing, or a smart documentation form when I'm already going to document, or even an order set when I'm already thinking of writing orders on this particular patient. Um, but there's a lot more focus now on proactive care. Uh, you know, can I do uh, population health? Can I identify that this particular patient uh, is a member of a risk group of some kind? And can I somehow give them a care plan that allows them to follow several different steps? So this is really a kind of CDS where I'm doing this longitudinally. So I'm saying, okay, this patient is, uh, is a TB patient. Now that little, uh, that little chart at the bottom right is actually a TB protocol for, uh, for the World Health Organization as they were testing new drugs. So I know this patient uh, should be screened. I need to check them for uh, for certain kind of drug toxicity. Um, I need to check them for respiratory symptoms. I need to check them for fevers and renal symptoms. And I need to do different things at different visits. So if I'm putting them on a year long protocol for a drug, I'm gonna to have to do certain things at one month, certain things at two months and so on. So the idea that I'm actually working off a flow chart and I'm working off a timed sequence of things that have tasks, that becomes a great way of using CDS for proactive longitudinal care where I can identify patients that belong to a risk group and actually execute and keep track of their care over the whole plan. Um, here's a broader view of that, that, uh, that TB thing and really sort of illustrates that there's lots of different things where if you're involved in global health, if you're involved in health in, in uh, lower and middle income countries and developing areas, um, there's a lot of things that you can take advantage of. Um, a lot of the problems there have to do with infectious diseases, HIV and, and, uh, and TB, uh, malaria and such. And there's a lot of ways to do syndromic surveillance, as I mentioned, to look for new flare-ups, to look for places where uh, potentially there's a new TB outbreak, new, look for places where uh, there might be a foodborne illness or a cholera epidemic. So being able to do that kind of syndromic surveillance is very important. Maternal health, maternal child health is a really important growing area. Uh, well, we've, we have the same number of people having babies, but the idea of being able to do proactive care for this is increasing, um, really improving child outcomes. So being able to do that with the kind of care pathways we've talked about is really important. And again, just like here, they're going to need ways to track patients who are eligible for COVID vaccinations and to be able to follow them and make sure that all of the regions have been properly vaccinated so there's no little, uh, little hot spots that can start to brew more infections and more variant, uh, more variant strains. So lots and lots of uses of CDS, uh, even in the relatively lower tech uh, administration systems that are available in these countries. Um, surveillance, again, same general idea. Surveillance is not only I talked about how to do population health on an individual basis, taking an individual patient and saying, okay, this patient is, should be following this particular pathway, this protocol. But on the broader example, on the population level, you know, how do I find out whether uh, you know, a lot of people are having emergency department visits? How do I find out whether uh, people are changing some particular key performance indicator? Um, so we had, there was one example that was done in Chicago recently where 
they were looking for frequent users of the emergency department. So they would actually be able to look at surveillance, be able to identify pockets where there were significant number of patients that were having uh, reuse of the emergency department, which is not considered a good thing, of course. Uh, and then if there were sufficient numbers, then we could send in a community team. Uh, they could go and drill down, look at the individual patients, uh, start providing individual interventions. And it also was an opportunity to set up uh, urgent care clinics so that patients that otherwise would be soaking up time in the emergency department could go to a lower cost more easily accessible, closer to their home kind of frequent flyer intervention. Um, so that's the kind of thing where if I know what's going on in the zone, um, then I can do that. Um, you've seen these used for opioids where they're trying to match up the regions of the, of the community where opioid overdoses are, are occurring and then using that as an opportunity to cite uh, opioid treatment centers so that people have really quick access and, and there's not a problem of actually getting to treatment centers. Um, other kinds of analytics, you know, this was, uh, you know, Google flu trends is something which, which was tried about a dozen years ago and has been tried again last year. Uh, this is the idea that uh, I can do analytics on all kinds of different pieces of data. In this case, the idea was, let's look at what people are searching for on Google. And if in a particular geographic area, people are searching for cough a lot more than they used to, or a lot more than the next region, then maybe that's because there's a lot of people coughing in that region. Maybe that's because there's a flu epidemic going on. Uh, originally in, in 2005 or six, when they first did this, the hope was that they could use this to detect flu epidemics faster than typical measures like actually doing flu tests. Um, it didn't work in the first time and it turned out that it was because uh, the data was not very good. Um, the, the data collection was fraught with all kinds of peril. People would test would, would talk about fever. It turned out there was a popular song at the time that had fever in it. And so a lot of people were actually just showing that they loved that particular song. Um, so there's all kinds of things in terms of getting clean data uh, to be able to do this. But uh, there have been some revisions made and the latest iteration of Google Health uh, is trying the latest iteration of Google Flu Trends to try and see if they can again use Google searching as a way of doing de-identified population level analytics and notification when things are happening that are, uh, that are worthy of intervention. So all kinds of different things. Um, there's lots of different CDS types. People are doing CDS on genomic data. Uh, there's more now where we're starting to get a little bit better handle on natural language processing uh, and being able to use text data, particularly for social determinants, um, which, in, which again is, is a important source of up and coming clinical decision support. Um, Multi-health, being able to do CDS, not just from one hospital, which is how most of it is done, but being able to do it across an entire region and being able to have decision support for a patient who sees several different doctors in a region, uh, the kind of thing that, that RIQI does, uh, the kind of things that, that InterSystems does, uh, is being able to gather together information from lots of different sources and pulling together common logic, common analytics, common decision support that can be brought to bear by this much wider, broader piece of information. And again, instead of just giving you alerts, we can use them to create checklists. Uh, we can use them to post alerts on social media for certain kinds of things. You're, many of you probably are tuned up to various Twitter bots, which are keeping track of when vaccinations are available in one of the vaccination centers. So that's a kind of thing where a form of decision support not so much patient specific in this case, is giving output on social media. Uh, GIS, like I showed you, showing where hotspots occur. Um, and patients are using CDS much more. Um, so everything from home, uh, everything from home devices, uh, from things like MyFitnessPal, which is a very popular weight loss application, which allows the patient to easily put in information or sometimes even just scan the barcodes on their food and we'll tell them whether they're keeping track of their diet, whether they need to do something better or worse. Um, being able to use bots, not so much like, like uh, the, the old uh, Alexa Silver ad from Saturday Night Live, but being able to actually talk to your Alexa device or whatever it is and have it remind you to keep track of your medications uh, is certainly a kind of CDS that's being applied to patients. And it needs to be formatted differently. So this one, which is a patient-focused uh, patient decision maker for cancer treatment is a way of looking at 
the options that you have. So you put in a couple of different things about your preferences. Do I prefer a longer life or a higher quality life? Do I prefer medication therapy or inpatient therapy? And it gives you a way to decide among yourself the different ways that you should or should not approach treatment options for your cancer. Um, so lots of different things that are being brought to bear for patients. And now that CMS has, uh, has ruled that patients have to have much greater access to their data, I expect to see a lot more of this happening in the near future. Um, and just to wrap up, uh, there are all kinds of different standards being brought to bear. Uh, CDS hooks is a fire uh, standard in the making, which is a way of communicating data between CDS services so that if you remember that diagram I had a little while back where everything was connected by APIs. So you can imagine the CDS service being in the middle of that. Uh, the CDS service is where all the logic is and where all the rules are, but that's connected from the EHR on the top left, which has a new prescription. The prescription gets fired off, sends out a CDS hook, which is a fire structure that can be accessed. Uh, the CDS service picks that up, does the appropriate logic, decides on what the recommendations are and returns what hooks parlance calls CDS cards, which can give you information which I can display in my EHR or on my phone, or which allows me to open up an app and which hopefully someday will allow me to write a new order on my system um, to be able to do that. So this is the way of the future, I think, where third-party apps will be able to uh, be able to use, be written once and used with many different electronic health records through the use of standards. Um, there's all kinds of different national operations going on in terms of sharing content. Uh, the National Library of Medicine strategic plan calls for being able to take uh, conclusions and algorithmic things that, that are published in papers and sort storing those in a digitally consumable form. Um, CDS Connect at the bottom is an AHRQ project designed to have a common way of storing CDS algorithms so that they can be reused, so that they can be uh, transferred to a variety of different electronic health records and someday actually sort of just dropped in and already brought to bear and already make themselves work into your workflow. Um, Mobilizing Computerized Biomedical Knowledge is a group coming out of the University of Michigan uh, which is uh, looking more at the learning health system aspects. So how do we take data uh, and be able to generate new knowledge that comes out of it, whether that becomes, whether that's statistical analysis, whether that's machine learning, how do I take data that's coming from new research papers or new uh, real world data or new, or new EHR data and be able to generate new rules, which then can feed into this entire pipeline. So lots of different national organizations are keeping track and trying to make it possible for CDS built in one place to not have to be replicated by the same intellectual process everywhere else. Um, and a lot of them are starting to use CQL, which is a language for specifying both quality measures and clinical decision support. Uh, and this is really kind of a, a high level meta language where I can specify uh, in this case for an asthma management plan, uh, lets me figure out which data values I need to use. Let's figure out what kind of uh, value sets, which is basically collections of data. Uh, and then it can do that to find standard logic constructs and to find the kinds of interventions that you would see happen in something like CDS hooks. And last but not least, machine learning as a component of all this. So, you know, machine learning is clearly good for a lot of things and clearly is a work in progress on others. We know it's great for imaging, uh, that it does very good in terms of, of performance on image recognition. Uh, we know it's probably quite good for, for being able to look at diseases of a lot of people and breaking that down into segments and clusters which might have different kinds of optimal treatments. Um, and then there's others that we're still waiting for. One of the machine learning's greatest problems is lack of explainability. Um, and just as I mentioned that being able to understand why this alert came to me is one of the biggest factors that leads to acceptance of the alert. So machine learning needs to certainly improve its act in terms of explainability. And obviously there's lots of work on that. Uh, machine learning needs to improve the data sources that are used because anybody that does ML will tell you that one of the biggest problems that the data is not clean enough, the data is not uh, really precise enough for what they want. Um, data is, is not very well kept much 
uh, compared to what we think it should. So I think there's possibilities for machine learning in terms of generating new knowledge, in terms of being able to do certain kinds of, of uh, CDS generation and really new rule generation. Uh, but I think it's still uh, in its adolescence, if not its infancy, and there's gonna be more work to be happening for uh, many sponsored research things to come. So that's about it. CDS is part of the answer to better medical care. Uh, it's not about the computer being a genius physician. It's about the computer being uh, a really conscientious medical student who doesn't necessarily know everything, but knows when something important is happening and can give you all the data so that your brain can say, gee, I guess we should put this person on a different antibiotic, or I guess we should turn left at Commerce Street. So that's about it for now. I'd be happy to take questions for the next little part of the area. And uh, if you wanna get in touch with me for anything uh, about this or about uh, my checkered little career, feel free to contact me. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, we do have a question. Um, and if there's other questions, just go ahead and add them into the chat, folks. Um, so the first question is, um, what is your opinion on using clinical decision support alert metadata as a component of professional practice evaluation? Oof. Uh, okay, that's, there's going to be a lot of people that get very nervous about that one. Um, I think it's, I think it's very, I think it is valuable in terms of experience logging. I think that being able to do not so much clinical decision support, but being able to do a metadata of other things to see whether I'm seeing enough cases, whether I'm seeing enough, uh, you know, a variety of cases, all that kind of stuff, I think is very valuable for professional practice valuation. Um, the, the question kind of implies that, uh, you know, I am, if, if I'm complying with CDS, then I'm a good doc. And if I'm not complying with CDS, then maybe I'm not so good a doc. And, you know, the problem is that we don't really want people complying with everything. We want the, the reason that we present this as a set of information is that it shouldn't be making the decision for you. It should be providing information to allow you to make the decision. It's clinical decision support, not, not clinical decision making. So I think that, I think it's useful in terms of being able to make sure that people, maybe there's something which says, you know, make sure that people are not just blowing something away altogether. But I think we have to be more careful about being able to understand why someone would take an exception to a rule and the fact is that we do want people to take exceptions to recommendations sometimes. So I'm not sure that I, I would support it as a, 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 uh, a litmus test. Great. The question that I have is, um, we've all of us who've been born and bred as informaticians, we're, 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 we're sold the, uh, the, the promise of clinical decision support. We learned about systems like QMR, um, DXplain, and, and uh, CDS was going to be everywhere. And yet it is rare to find an electronic health record system that doesn't implement just very basic if-then rules. What happened? Um, I think people followed where they actually wanted to, where they felt they could take action. Um, you're right. Uh, and and when, I be, when I first got into informatics about, you know, 97 years ago, there was, uh, that was it. It was, it was about, it was QMR, it was Iliad, it was Mycin, it was all the, what we now pretty much call diagnostic decision support. It was the, it was the expert physician. It was the thing that said, you know, throw in all your patient symptoms and I'll tell you what the patient has got. Um, sounds exciting. It sounds like what you would think of in a particular form of your development. But first of all, you know, Doctors don't really want that. Doctors don't really want someone saying, you know, here's what this person has, you nincompoop. Um, they, 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 do people say nincompoop anymore? I don't know. Um, I do. It's okay. <laughs> um, I think it's a three stooges thing. I'm not sure. But, um, but the, uh, but, you know, they, it, it's, first of all, as, as doctors and nurses, we have access to more information than the computer does. So there's very often some other things that are going on. Now, that said, I think it is a diagnostic system which shows me some options and lets me think of some things that I haven't thought of before, um, that might be nice. If I was thinking of appendicitis and they said, well, you know, have you thought about you know, mesenteric ischemia? Because that would sort of work pretty well on this system also. Then I can think of, oh yeah, mesenteric ischemia, let me think about that. So as a suggester of possibilities, um, that makes some sense. But the fact is that it's just, too personally intrusive on what we think we're supposed to be doing. Um, so I think it never got done. Plus it's hard to perfect. Whereas an alert that says, hey, you've prescribed a drug to which the patient is allergic. 
that's something I can say, oh, you're right, good, I can flip that without feeling like my, my ego is being bruised in some way or another. I think it's just a matter of actionability, simplicity, uh, ability to get the correct data, and just kind of what it means to me as a doctor and that the computer is my partner and not my boss. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions from anyone else in the audience? Now, I'll ask you to reflect for a moment, Jonathan, in, in, in your years through looking at, and in various contexts, uh, clinical decision support, um, what has been sort of your view of the greatest success that we've had in clinical decision support that sets us up for our future as we go forward? Well, certainly all kinds of preventive, adverse event prevent, prevention has been, has been great. Uh, particularly medication errors. Uh, you know, most of the, uh, there's been a lot of great work done on medication errors. Some of the uh, sort of the, the seminal work that led to the fact that we all have order entry systems uh, began in the fact that uh, there was these uh, original Institute of Medicine report that says originally 44,000 people were dying. Uh, and then we realized that a lot of these were preventable adverse errors. And then uh, researchers like uh, Bill Tierney, David Bates, uh, lots of other people did studies to say, okay, we can really pin these down to certain kinds of medication errors. And then, uh, you know, several different groups in about five or six leading medical centers were able to say, hey, if we put this in place, you know, these errors go away. And in fact, the number of adverse events has been severely reduced, uh, which, is, which is terrific. So that started with medications. I think it has certainly expanded to health maintenance uh, and being able to see that patients are not missing out on various kinds of preventive care. Uh, immunization CDS has been very important in terms of a public health thing. So a lot of things where there's things that were supposed to happen and you could put them in a list and see what was missing or things where I was doing something and there was something wrong with that. So I think those are probably the biggest things. I think probably the most commonly used CDS pound for pound is probably order sets. I don't even think of them as CDS, but they guide our, our lives every day. Yeah, that's great. There's actually a, a contention to raise about uh, diagnostic uh, systems. And so do you not think that the high level of impact and impact of diagnostic errors will drive more use of diagnostic decision support? No doctor is perfect. No, but the numbers who think they are is probably higher than that. <laughs> um, it's a... Uh... It's a lot more psychology, I think, than it is information technology. Um, I think that, you know, I, I, I think that, yes, it's true. And certainly, if you look at uh, places where people have tried to do things, IBM, Watson, uh, which I know is, is up for sale now, but they, they tried to, they wanted to collect uh, cancer diagnostic knowledge from the best centers in the US. And they basically packaged it up in a way that developing countries could use so they would kind of have a in the box, you know, US expert di diagnostician with them. So yeah, diagnostic errors are certainly a big deal. Um, I think there would need to be research on whether these things are actually making a difference in the field, just like the original CDS had to prove its value in, in, uh, in research studies. So can I do some kind of a controlled experiment that says when I use this, um, I not only get to the diagnosis faster, but the patients do better. So I think there's studies that need to be done, which I don't know, uh, maybe you know more, Neil, whether those have been done a lot. I know Ida Berner, who's one of, a, one of the best uh, experts in diagnostic decision support, has certainly done a lot of research on this. So yeah, it's high impact, um, but I just think that it's difficult because it's very complex. It's not a bite-size thing that I can see, oh yes, change this drug. Oh yes, change this allergy. It's such a a larger thing. So yeah, it should have impact, probably should be used more than it is used. Um, we are probably missing diagnoses that these could tell us about, but I think it's gotta have proven value and it's gotta sort of be, uh, frankly, it has to stroke people's egos in the right way also. There is some psychology to it. Yeah, and I think I think a big piece that you um, alluded to is the explainability because yes. uh, especially like in, in, in my business, uh, uh, we are dealing with lots and lots of fractionated data. You can't just put it all together and then magic happens. Um, it's why was a decision made? Was it made on what pieces of information? So the human can actually make some judgment on that. 
Um, so what's a friendly way to do this? And so what methods do you prefer for gathering requirements of providers in terms of what they need or want for clinical decision support? Wow. Um, we wrote, <laughs> this is what we wrote a book about. Um, there is, uh, you know, there's a whole methodology and, uh, my, my frequent comrade in arms, Jerry Osheroff, is, is kind of someone who, who spent a lot of his time working with systems after uh, medical system after medical system, trying to get people to think about how they approach these problems. Um, you know, when we were writing this book about improving outcomes, we sort of set up this entire set of worksheets where you could go to your appropriate people. First, we have to identify who your appropriate stakeholders were, because very often they, some people were left out. And then you can go to your stakeholders and help and help them define a problem. Like our problem is we have too many deep vein thromboses. Um, and then say, okay, can we do a little bit of a root cause analysis to figure out where we are able to stop them and aren't? So can we figure out what the best practices should be? Uh, and then you get to the point where we say, now that we know what the practices should be, can I put them into strategically placed CDS at strategic parts of the workflow so that when I admit a patient, I'll know to assess their risk. It'll be baked into their order set. And when I see a patient that's at, at bed rest, I'll know that those people should have an extra dose of, 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 low, of, of uh, you know, uh, an oxaparin or something like that. So, so I think that it's, it's a, it starts from figuring out what your problem is, figuring out where the solutions lie. And really it starts from looking at multiple different stakes in the doctor, nurse, pharmacist, dietitian, uh, you know, administrator process to see where we can put these things together best. Um, but having done that, turning that into something that is uh, computable is something which I think is more tractable. That's great. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today, Jonathan. Uh, I know that everyone uh, was really very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts. And um, I will uh, uh, further encourage, uh, especially the students in the audience to reach out uh, to Jonathan to share, um, uh, to, to get some more advice on uh, career paths and things that one can do as a hero in informatics. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, good luck to all of you. And, uh, and it's great to spend this time.